Hello everybody, welcome to Karma Hub. Today we are connecting with Laura Haug, who is a intuitive guide. We will be talking about some of these turbulent and often divided issues and, and how to create alignment and integrity within yourself. She can help you operate outside of fear and ego and step into your inner truth and strength. So I hope you enjoy this discussion and you can of course reach out to her through the Karma Hub website. Um, so click on that Karma Hub like button and the Karma Hub subscribe button. Thank you so much. Enjoy. So I think it's just an interesting kind of concept to play with of what is being selfish? What is this? I mean, I, I think you hear a lot like civic responsibility and like we have to do what's for the greater good of all. Who's deciding that? How do we really know that? One of the best definitions I've heard of um, to differentiate between being selfish and self-care. And okay. when you're practicing self-care, you're putting your needs over someone else's wants. And when you're practicing being selfish, you're putting your wants over someone else's needs. Mm. Now, the thing here is that we can't know what someone else wants or needs. Gotcha, only, right. I can, I can, only I can know what my needs are, why they're my needs, and then what my wants are and why they're my wants. So that's all that we really can know is this is what I need. This is why I need it. And then if someone wants me to do something because it would make them feel better, well, is that not the definition of selfish? For me, it's like it's the macrocosm and the microcosm. Like you can see what's going on on this macro level, but right. how we actually affect it is by turning inward and resolving whatever divides we have within ourselves or conflicts we have within ourselves. I think that's a huge part of it is just people are overwhelmed and they don't have the emotional support that they need and they don't know how to get it and they don't even realize they need it. <laughs> and it's like, I can't force people to tell them that they would actually benefit working with me, but because you have to want to work with me. You have to want to work with any healer. Like, but you can't expect them to do the work for you. They can't want it more than you. Like you have to want it for yourself before, the, before you know, you can start to see some results. Do you want to start a little bit with your background and, and how you got to where you are now? Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, you know, even with the health stuff, I know, I know that I had um, some stuff kick up 20 years ago. And, and as I reflect even further upon it, I think it really goes back to even when I was born because I was born with a, a heart defect where I had a valve that was open and was supposed to be closed. And so I had heart surgery at eight months old. And then when I was three months old or three years old, um, I actually was so sick with like pneumonia and a fever and a double ear infection that they wouldn't even keep me in the hospital. I was so sick. And so my mom actually had the anointing of the sick or what's now known as the last rites done on me. <laughs> wow. And, um, and so I guess when the, when the priest did that anointing, um, my whole body must have shaken. And then, um, within 24 hours, the fever broke and I was perfectly fine. And the doctor had no medical explanation of what was going on. And so wow. I feel like there was a part of my soul or something that came into this world, just already kind of challenged with health stuff. And then, um, right after high school, um, yeah, things kicked up again. And I was having all kinds, I was vomiting every single morning. Um, there was basically it that went on for weeks before I kind of got to a really negative place mentally of just like not wanting to be here. Like, yep, I could check out right now. I'd be fine with that just because I was in so much discomfort of anxiety and depression and physical stuff and not being able to eat and just, you know, like it was really challenging. And so when doctors were never able to tell me what was going on, just like, you're too young to be dealing with this. Like, we can't find anything wrong with you. We don't know what's going on. Good luck with that. <laughs> it, it starts to kick you into a gear of like, all right, well, I understand that maybe I've been stressed, but you know, what is that connection? And so that started to just lead me on this whole like personal growth of like learning the mind body connection and learning about um, you know, how we affect things. And I think when you go through like 20 years of always finding doctors that aren't able to really give you answers on anything, it's really forced me to look into a lot of different 
other modalities and how that spiritual mind body connection really does work. And so, um, you know, the, the bottom line, I think with all of it is realizing that all of that health stuff, it wasn't my fault. And this whole time I had been thinking it was my fault. And I was curious, like, I think there's just so many people that I kind of wonder if they get into a headspace of that, of just how that mental aspect can really affect us on so many levels in life and even affect us physically um, because of just how much I think it's all connected. So it definitely led me down a road of, you know, um, of health things. But other than that, like I had been in, in um, the entertainment industry for over 13 years okay. and kind of just got burnt out from that as well. Cause I was project manager and post-production in, in LA and, you know, just kind of get, you see everyone get burnt out and run down and um, you start to feel that as well. And then you start to question what you're really passionate about. And then you start to notice patterns. And I was always the person that everyone felt comfortable talking to. <laughs> They would come to me for all their problems and ask for guidance and support. And I actually, that was my favorite part. I think about all of my jobs was being that kind of emotional support. And then I realized, oh, wait, I I can actually go do that. So that's what led me into yoga teacher trainings and life coaching trainings and energy healing and reading tarot and writing and all of those aspects just to support people in that emotional component. Wow. So the things that you liked most about the entertainment business the things you did kind of on the side, you, you grabbed those and ran with it and continue doing that. Yeah. Like and the I think, coaching aspect of it. Yes. Cause there was definitely a moment in time where I was at a specific job, just kind of miserable. And, you know, it's like, it's kind of the, the thing where, all right, well, I, I went to school and I got the good job and I'm in the relationship and why am I not happy? <laughs> and you start to question things and physically I was getting run down again. And it, it reminded me of that time right after high school where it was like, okay, um, I'm, if I don't handle this stress, if I don't do something with this, then I'm going to end up in the hospital again. And I do not want to go down that path. So what different decisions do I need to make? And that's when I quit my job and started teaching yoga and learning all the things and getting to work with people and, and loving that aspect of everything. So you mentioned um, energy medicine. So I'm pretty fascinated with all of that and Reiki. And there's so many, I mean, I guess probably thousands of different energetic modalities that are out there. Can you tell me a little bit about Reiki and how it works and how you think it uh, helps improve people's lives? Yeah. Um, So yes, I'm a Reiki master and it's an ancient Japanese hands-on healing technique. And I practice um, the holy fire version of Reiki, um, which is very high level consciousness. It's very warming and loving. It respects free will. It's um, it goes where it needs to go in order to, to help and heal people. And the way that I like to explain it is we have our physical body. We take care of, we brush our teeth, we take showers, we, you know, we put good foods in our body. Um, but we don't, we aren't always aware that we have this energy field around us. And this energy field is how we even connect with people. It's like, when you meet someone, you're like, Oh, I like them, but you don't know them. Or you meet someone, you're like, there's something about them. I don't like it's that it's their energy that you're feeling. It's, it's how everyone has a different size energy field where someone can walk into a building and you know that they're there, even though they're not in the room. And yet someone can walk up right behind you and you don't even feel them. And then they're like, Hey, and you're like, Oh, I didn't even since right. you there. Right. again, that's like just the different like um, energy fields. And so what happens is when we have um, life experiences from ever once we were born, when we have these life experiences, sometimes they can be traumatic, they can be deep wounds, they can be happy experiences. They all get, they all get in our energy field. And what we need to do sometimes is just clean it out. <laughs> and that's what Reiki does is it's kind of like, if you have a, a clogged drain, you put Drano down it. Um, well, in order to clear your energy field of stuck energy, you need energy work, okay. <laughs> no, no matter what form it is. I think that's right. kind of the, the best way of like explaining it's, we got to just keep it clear because that energy field, it, it holds our stories. It holds our beliefs about ourselves. It holds Um, like snapshot images of our experiences that that's how we then kind of filter and see the world. And when we can keep that clear, we can see things more clearly versus getting stuck behind illusions or stories that actually aren't accurate, accurate for us anymore. They just get kind of lodged in our energy field and they just need some help either bringing it to the conscious mind um, 
And then even that energy, how it gets stuck in our body. Like if we have an experience and we didn't fully process it emotionally, it gets stuck in the body as these undigested experiences. So someone might be feeling something on the physical level that's really connected to energy. So when you can tap in from that angle, it can help relieve the physical symptoms, especially if you, if you kind of look at things from a somatic perspective of dropping them into the body of understanding, you know, what is so this the, these last two, two years? Uh, well, I guess a year and a half, year and three quarters. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing and experiencing um, and, and working with your clients and helping them trying to make sense of everything that's going on? Yeah. And we are living in some really, really interesting times. Um, yeah. Whether people are aware of the energy or not, people are feeling it. <laughs> Right. And it's, um, I'm seeing a lot of different themes. I mean, I think when this all started, um, I kind of sat in a meditation with myself just going, okay, what is this all about? What's going on right now? And the message I received was the first word I heard was control. And I was right. like, okay, control, what's going on with that? And I can't control anything outside of me. So how does control show up in my life? And that was the first theme I started to see was, when people's jobs, you know, things are shifting. It's like, okay, what is our relationship to control? What do I actually have control over and sitting with that? So for me, I had to look at, at those aspects of myself and dive in within that, but then seeing that happening on an energetic, like collective level. And even, I mean, even I would just got back spending time with family and my 14 year old niece was even talking about control. She's like, I mean, I only have control over so much aunt Laura, like, <laughs> like I have control over my responses. And I was like, Oh, she's brilliant. Like she's already picking up this common theme that is going on collectively. And then we see how it's happening on a larger scale. So it, for me, it's like, it's the macrocosm and the microcosm. Like you can see what's going on on this macro level but right. how we actually affect it is by turning inward and resolving whatever divides we have within ourselves or conflicts we have within ourselves. Um, and so the other aspects that I, I feel like I'm seeing, like control is definitely one, one theme of how, you know, I have to work with people and be like, what do you actually have control over? Like, let's look at that. And then, um, I mean, collective trauma is a big thing. We're all going through collective trauma whenever something in our lives gets shaken up in some level and everyone's gonna respond to it differently. And so I see a lot of dysregulated nervous systems um, of just you know, anxiety and worry and concern and just people going from like one extreme to the other where there's like the depression and the mental um, struggles. And then the people going into that like hyper- hyperactive mode where it's just go, go, go energizer bunny, because they're also just trying to cope with everything that's going on. A lot of people in the fight mode of like ready to just like put their gloves on and go fighting. You have people frozen, not knowing what do I do right now? There's so many unknowns. How do I deal with this? Um, and then, and then, you know, you just have to kind of get back into the body. So there's a lot of, that's how I'm working with people too, is let's get back into the body because that's how that energy is showing up is we're wanting to disassociate. We're wanting to check out. And then we have to kind of bring ourselves back in and be really present with what's showing up right now, as we kind of all navigate the different levels of trauma. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned to me, you said, uh, I, I think you mentioned it was like one of your gifts is you can look into their soul. You, you're, you can kind of act as a direct channel for the people and yeah, you're kind of a, a facilitator for the soul. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty cool gift, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's what it is. I mean, I, I yeah. think it's when, you know, I can look at someone and just go, how are you doing? And they're like, I'm fine. I'm like, are you? And they're like, how did you know? Like, I just feel it. I see it. It's in your eyes. It's in your, it's in your energy field. It's something I can feel that, um, you know, people just want to be seen on that, that deeper level of, you know, I can pick up when someone's not really in alignment with what they want to do. You know, they're, they're, they think it's something over here. And then I kind of go over here and I'm like, but what about this? And they're like, oh, that's actually the thing. And I'm like, yeah. That comes in handy when you're a coach, right? Now, oh. is that, is that something that you can um, see or you just kind of know or, or sense in some other way? You know, a lot of it really depends on the person. 
and where they're at, because some people aren't ready for that. Some people don't want to go that deep yet. Um, so I'm really just reading the comfort level of the person and, you know, some people we gotcha. get together and we can just drop right in and we go to the depths of things. And I find that like needle in the haystack and go, this is what's going on. And they're like, yes, that's what it is. And then they start to have these breakthrough moments where they're, they're able to start to move forward because gotcha. we've identified a deeper value or something else that they're really passionate about, whatever that thing might be. Whereas other so some people, people, so some people will actually let you into like, give you permission to go into the energy field yeah, and, and work within that. And other other people just keep it fairly superficial for a while until that trust is gained. Yes. Well, so much of it's safety too. And so much is, of it is how much has, has, what work has, other, have they done? What are the inner words? What are the inner workings that they've already done? What's the extent of that they already know about themselves and understand about themselves? Because some people are just at, they're just at different points in their journey and their story of gotcha. like, they need just a little extra support, a little extra guidance. They need some tools on how to navigate this and they need to go back and do the work themselves and then they can come back and then we can dive in even more at that point. So, um, and I do see people kind of, they would start with just a session here, a session there. And then years later, they're like, okay, let's work together for a while because it just has to be that like planting seeds and everyone's on their timeline and, um, and me just respecting and feeling that process from them because you can cause more damage if you try to push someone too soon. And you, you know, you, it's like, being, yeah. And being in this role, like I, I have had damage done to me, like, you know, not as like a victim, but just recognizing that this role, when you're a healer, when you're a coach, like the, this, when people are handing their psyches and their souls over to you, you have to handle that with care. And for me, I have to be in a lot of an integrity and alignment with myself on what I stand for and how I show up to make sure I'm staying in my lane, right. um, to find that balance. I have, I have a friend of mine who's a, uh, um, I don't know if she's a psychiatrist, maybe she's a psychologist. Um, anyway, but she can, it's interesting. She, so she sees auras to some degree, but there's a very particular thing that happens when someone makes a statement and it's not congruent. Like it's either a flat out lie or, or, or maybe they're just not quite aware, but it's just not congruent with their body. And when that happens, forget what color she sees, but it just kind of radiates this weird vibration and she can, she can mm -hmm. visually see this weird vibration. And so, I mean, I, I just always thought that that was just the most, if you're a therapist, wouldn't it be great if you knew if you're, if the people that you're working on, when they weren't exactly um, truthful on some level, right? Whether it's subliminally or, 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 or subconsciously or, or, or consciously. Uh, but she did say what, what you're saying. She said that you can't just call them out on it. You can't just be like, hey, hey, what you just said, that's, that's not quite right. Because that, that doesn't always go over very well, right? <laughs> so you have to kind of tiptoe around and, 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 um, it works for magic, I guess, but, but it's still a pretty cool tool to, to have. And I guess you, it seems like you have, um, that intuition that allows you to have a, a very similar tool in that sense. Yeah. And I think it just helps in like kind of knowing what kind of questions do I need to ask to help them unlock if they want to, what those deeper truths are for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, it, and for me, it's like, I have to just detach from whatever outcome happens with a client because I'm just here to show them. And then it's there. That's where they get to be empowered is in what they want to do with the information that we discover and how do they want to move forward with that. Um, so it's, it's quite the interesting process. I, I personally love it quite a bit. <laughs> Human behavior just fascinates me in general. Yeah. So yeah. How, how, how deep do you want to get into everything that's going on right now? You know, it, it would be nice if we could navigate carefully around the happenings of the world. <laughs> like you already kind of mentioned, like kind of just what's going on in the world. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there's a huge, there are huge narratives going on um, yeah. and it, it doesn't really matter what narrative you believe. I mean, it does and it doesn't. Right. Um, regardless of what you believe, there is a nar narrative going on that um, you don't agree with. Yeah. Right. And we have to 
tolerate that on, on some level. We have to figure out how that's going to work for us or, or what decision we're going to make. And so you were just saying that really what needs to be done is you need to figure out what works for each person individually. Because I imagine you coach people that are very um, pro-vax and you probably also coach people that are not so pro-vax. And you need to lead in a way that works for those people individually and not what your beliefs are or my beliefs are or. Yes. Yeah. And I think with that, like it starts with me feeling an integrity with myself and knowing where am I coming from? Like, what do I value? If I value people having choices, then I'm going to coach from a place where I make sure that my clients know they have choices and which ones feel most aligned for them based on their values and based on where they're at in life right now and empower them in that. Because I did have a client where something was brought up around these big topics and her, her response was, I didn't know I had a choice. Oh, And that really opened my eyes of, oh, okay, let's work from that place. What are the, like, if you had a choice, what are your choices? And now which one feels best for you? And being able to see that client get to a place where they felt really empowered with what they decided, it didn't matter what I thought. Like, that's not why I'm there. I'm there for them. Like, If they're feeling empowered, like if that's a value of mine is empowering people, then who am I to judge or who am I to know what is, what is going to be best for them? Like my role is just to love on them and to hold space for them and be a safe container for them to explore what their soul or their spirit is asking for them from them and then supporting them in that. And I think that's just been my perspective through all of this after I kind of sorted through my own, you know, moments of being charged around things and what do I think and how do I feel? And then what do I settle into? And I settle into the fact that I'm going to do what I feel is best for me. And then I'm going to really encourage and support people to do what they feel is best for them. And that really comes down to just our people being in integrity with their values. Do they even know what their values are? Right. Well, that's I think that makes a lot of sense because you don't have to listen to the media. It doesn't matter which side you're listening to. Right. Uh, right. Once again, I want to stress that <laughs> Absolutely. Um, because there are two big swings going on. We can operate from the perspective of what feels right to us. We don't have to do, or we don't have to believe, or we don't have to um, uh, abide by the media. We can do our own thing. And again, It swings both ways. (laughs) So, um. Absolutely. I mean, I I think all of that is just so fascinating um, because yeah, I I really come from that standpoint too of, I don't, I don't really subscribe super strongly to anything. Like I always tend to find myself in this kind of middle of the road and being able to see the um, two sides of the coin, (laughs) whether it's politics or medical decisions or whatever it is, I'm always seeing like even fear has two sides of the same coin, which, you know, have been interesting conversations with people of like someone having a fear of one thing, the opposite of that, someone having the other fear and then going, cool, what makes one fear more valid than the other? Who decides that? Because really, if that's what you're afraid of, then how do we get you to a place where you use that fear or you keep that fear from over-functioning, you're aware of it. And then you, you drop into a space of like, what's important to you. And then how do you plan and prepare in a way that you feel good about so that you can continue moving forward in your life, even with so many unknowns around us, because what all that is really asking us to do is to come back and be in the present moment and to go, what's showing up for me right now. And the divide that we're seeing is, um, is really for me, just a reflection on the divide people are feeling internally, the internal conflicts that they're having Mm. with themselves. And that's really where I want to help people find more congruency and, and connection is, you know, we're constantly in this conflict of like, part of me says this, and part of me says that it's, you know, the, the parts work when they, you know, when they talk about therapy and stuff and, 
And I've even experienced that myself with my own therapist of like, oh yeah, here are all these parts and here's what they say, but what is the common goal between all of it? Right. Like all these different parts of ourselves, what is actually that core piece? And then how do you get all those parts to come together and move forward in a direction that then feels, you know, in a way where we're not, where we can have respect for someone to have a different belief or decision than us. Um, because respect, I feel like is kind of lost right now. <laughs> I think there's just a huge lack of respect of, of yeah. someone being able to believe something different because really it's just, uh, it's, we're perceiving it as like some sort of reflection on us. Like I want to be a good person and be perceived as a good person, but you're challenging that. So right. how do, so really that's that's my work to do if I'm being charged around that. And what we're doing is we're all just kind of walking around right now, putting that on to other people. And so where does, then we have to kind of redefine what is responsibility, who is responsible for what, and we can't decide that for other people. We have to decide that for ourselves. What is my definition of responsibility? Where do I feel like I feel solid and alignment with myself? And then where can I offer a lot of compassion and understanding for other people? I think it comes down to like one of the best definitions I've heard of um, to differentiate between being selfish and self-care. And okay. when you're practicing self-care, you're putting your needs over someone else's wants and when you're practicing being selfish you're putting your wants over someone else's needs mm. now the thing here is that we can't know what someone else wants or needs That's only right. I, can, I can only i can know what my needs are why they're my needs and then what my wants are and why they're my wants so that's all that we really can know is this is what I need. This is why I need it. And then if someone wants me to do something because it would make them feel better, well, is that not the definition of selfish? So I think it's just an interesting kind of concept to play with of what is being selfish? What is this? I mean, I, I think you hear a lot like civic responsibility and like we have to do what's for the greater good of all. Who's deciding that? How do we really know that? And I think that's, but we're also, a, we're human. We are wired for connection. We're wired to belong. Like we will go against our own needs. We will go against the things that we know to be true in an attempt to belong with the people around us. And so, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of the ash experiment, but it, I forget, I don't know. I don't know if it was seventies, eighties, I could be totally wrong on that. But it really talks, it, I mean, it, it shows how this plays out because people have this sense of belonging or because a group of people will say, this is the right thing. And then you're sitting here questioning yourself, but if all those people <laughs> say that, then, okay, then I guess I'm not right. So we're also in a society that wants us disconnected from our own intuition, from our own knowing. And then we aren't, we aren't being empowered or shown how to stand for what we feel is right because we will risk being rejected and not accepted and then we risk being alone and i don't think anyone wants that yeah you know and i think for me this is a kind of personal um the everything you said makes a whole lot of sense and i'm totally in agreement with that and i i think that's one of the things one of the reasons maybe the reason why the mandates which do bother me an awful lot yeah bother me so much because they're in many ways not giving people a choice they're not yeah. allowing people to make their own decisions um you know and that's kind of what america is all about isn't it not We're to get too uh, patriotic but right. um but yeah so you know, from where I stand, from my perspective, everybody could do whatever it is they want to do. Yes. And then the government has been getting involved and that hasn't been the case recently. So I do have a big issue with that, but that's not really part of this talk. So, <laughs> but no, it does, it does support what you're saying, you know, um, 
because I'm heavily against them too. And it, it absolutely takes away. And it, and it, I just like to ask those bigger questions around all of that of, you know, when in history was it, was it ever on the, the, I mean, I don't want to say right side, cause I, you know, that can even probably be questioned, but like, right. when has it ever been okay to um, discriminate, to segregate, to force things? Like when has that ever been on the side of history that we haven't looked back on and been like, how could they allow that to happen? We would never allow that to happen, but it's always disguised by a lot of good people thinking they're doing good things, but not questioning. And yeah, the mandates are scary there. That's a scary thing right now. And that's a lot of lives that are being affected in a lot of different ways. And you're in California, right? I am. Okay. So you're getting hit pretty hard with all of this. With yes. These mandates, or at least the people around you. I don't know about you personally, but. The, um, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. And um, I think for me, the where I've kind of come to some peace with it um, is knowing that if I stay true to myself, I will be provided for no matter what. And that doesn't mean that I won't have tough moments or hard times, but you, if you, you know, I, I just, whether, no matter what I believe around vaccines, I do not support mandates. <laughs> so I will not be supporting, you know, places or businesses that are, are going to be implementing those things. And so for me, I also just see it as like, I'm just going to be the water. I mean, water flows, water moves around things. So, you know, Love if it. something comes up and it's in my way, ugh, okay, that's going to be a bummer. And I'll just kind of move around it and I'll find a way around it because that's how I know that I'm wired because I'm going to stick with what I feel is um, what's right for all. Well, I think that's a good philosophy for life. You know, you always are presented with obstacles problems difficulties and if you're like water you just learn to flow you learn to dance with it you learn to move through it and around it and uh i guess the mandates are just one more thing right <laughs> so, it's it would be hard to go back from those like yes no i agree i i do agree it, it changes the foundation yeah the way things and, are handled so it like is said, it is a big deal i didn't don't mean to uh, diminish it in, uh, no importance at all um no, that yeah. was just me coming alongside you and adding to it that it's a big deal <laughs> yes and i think it's really interesting that whole censor censor censorship piece because there is an enormous amount of that going on and i think it's been interesting to see how it shows up for people because that's really like your voice like if we're already feeling stifled <laughs> you know or if we have depending on what someone's beliefs are like I believe in, in past lives. I've had many visions of me doing similar work and speaking up for what I feel is, is right. It feels like it's been very consistent in all of these lives and everything revolved around my voice. It was never safe to speak up. It was never safe to, <laughs> mm. to be truly who I am because it was always in opposition of someone trying to oppress or control or manipulate or, you know, like I've had many visions of me, you know, being beheaded or hung or my throat slit or, you know, being a witch that was hung, like whatever those have been. Um, it's interesting how it's showing up now of, right. all right, now it's like what's a digital like? version of that. <laughs> it is. It's like, okay, now, now where is that like fine line? Because people are getting deleted. So much stuff is being censored. So much stuff is, so much information is not being out there for people to decipher on their own. And it's like, we've, why have we lost our, our, um, why have we lost our ability in our, our fellow humans to be able to discern for themselves what they feel is correct information or right for them, or even just to have dialogues or discussions um, around science, like, yeah, I'm all for science and I'm all for all science to discuss it all. Let's look at all viewpoints. Um, and and all, me, all data. All data. And then let yes. me decide what I feel is best for me and, and 
you know, based on my personal, like what shows up for my body and, and, you know, like everyone's different, everyone's unique and we've taken that away. So in, in the midst of all this chaos, how do you work with people to allow them to be true, to, true to themselves? How, how do you encourage that truth within themselves, despite everything that's going on? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think before someone can even begin that process of, cause I kind of have like some stages or steps to go through kind of a process of, you know, identifying those things. But I think before someone can even stay true to themselves, they have to regulate themselves. They have to make sure that they're connected to their body, um, that they're able to get into a calm state um, as much as they can right now, especially with the chaos, because otherwise we don't know if we're operating from fear, if we're operating from an old trigger, from an old wound, um, if it's our intuition, if it's our ego, like we can get very confused when we're in this um, state of chaos, which we're all picking up on, on some level. Um, and once you can do that, I mean, and, and part of that, even first phase is it's all observation. Like before we can really even stay true to ourselves, we have to observe where we're currently at and what is actually important to us. And so this state of observation can be setting your alarm on your phone multiple times a day, just to stop and go, what am I experiencing in this moment? Like, what do I feel physically? What am I sitting on? What am I standing on? How does it, how does the temperature in the room feel? What's it like to have uh, the way my, my clothes feel on my skin? What am I seeing, smelling, tasting, like dropping in and just noticing physically, how do I feel? And then mentally, what thoughts do I have right now? Emotionally, how am I feeling? And doing a quick little 30 seconds of just scanning the moment. <laughs> And when you do this multiple times a day for days on end, you start to notice some patterns and those patterns can lead you to things that you value um, or noticing where you're getting pulled away from yourself or where you're feeling like comparison. And then you're not feeling great about yourself or what's triggering you or what's giving, you know, charging your energy up. Like when you can just be in those moments several times a day of just checking in without judgment, not trying to change anything, just oh, I'm feeling really tired right now. And um, ugh, I'm really sad for some reason. And then ugh, I just have this like stupid reoccurring thought that just keeps going over and over and over. And I wish I could get my thought out of my head, whatever, that's what I'm noticing. And then boom, you move on with your day and then you wait for the next alarm. And then you start to connect these patterns. So this is kind of the first stage of observation. Hmm. From there, you're able to drop into a place of clarity. Like maybe you start to notice a theme. Maybe you get really annoyed that people aren't being accountable with what they're doing. They're, what they're saying is not lining up with what they're doing. And you start to notice that really makes you mad. Well, okay, accountability is important to you. Great, people aren't being accountable to themselves. How do you know when someone's being accountable? And then how do you know when you're being accountable to yourself? Maybe you're not really upset with them. They're just the external reflection of you being upset with yourself for not following things through on things that you've said you wanted to do. So this is kind of the clarity aspect of like redefining words that you start to notice from these patterns. Um, from that place, then you have options. Ideally, <laughs> ideally you have options <laughs> and you get to lay all those options out and go, cool, which one feels most aligned for me right now? Which one feels best for me? And that's where I like to come back to the body because the body really always guides us on what feels good and doesn't. And so asking yourself with each option, how does this feel in my body? And noticing, do you get softer? Do you get more relaxed? Do you feel tense? Do you feel tight? Because each of those responses is telling you something is off or something's aligned with that option. And we don't even have to know what it is right away. Like the reasoning, we just have to, to tune into it. So that's kind of my next process is like, what are your choices? And now which one feels best for you? And then you have to take action on it. And once you follow through and take action, that's where you start to build more trust for yourself. That's where you build up your intuition. Um, and then you get to start to see an outcome. And that outcome, that feedback is going to be information for you on, are you staying true to yourself? Because you're staying true to yourself. Well, first we have to identify that. How do you know when you're being, how will you know when you're being true to yourself? Like, is it going to be a feeling? Is it going to be a knowing? Is it going to be, you've achieved something? That's how you'll, 
every person's going to be different on how they're going to know that they've been true to themselves. So then you take that feedback that you've just done from this process and you, you compare it to your notes of what it, what it is to be true to yourself. And if it aligns, great, you're on the great path. And if you're not cool, it's just feedback. There's no failure. You go back and you start all over. You observe, you get clear, you look at your choices, you take action, and then you see the feedback. Nice. Oh, okay. I feel like this that makes is, a lot of sense. I feel like it's a process of, yeah, like these are ways that I can check in and go, did this feel right to me? Did, did, did this feel like my spirit's happy right now with that decision, even if it was hard, <laughs> right? Because our hard decisions can lead to um, a lot of grief, like a grief of old parts of ourselves, a grief of old friendships, relationships, jobs, like it can lead to those when we're staying true to ourselves, which means that that's a whole other thing that then we have to process through. And I think that's a lot of also what's going on right now is people aren't recognizing the level of grief we all are going through from so many changes, like life as we knew it, it's no longer. (laughs) And there's just an enormous amount of grief within that alone of lifestyle changes um, that people are having to grasp and handle. And then because of this divide, uh, because of, you know, everyone making different decisions and there's kind of a lack of respect for, you know, or there can be respect and then just give each other space and knowing, okay, maybe we can come back together at another point in time, but that's still a loss. That's still grief. That's still mourning. Um, so it's just, it's heavy times right now. You know, it can also be really good and it can be a a new canvas for what we want to create and how we want to move forward and taking the good from the previous experiences we've had and and applying that and then creating, you know, something new on how we want to build our lives moving forward and what's important to us. And then how do we align ourselves and be in integrity with that? Mm -hmm.